ಓಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೋರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು So in the Bhagavad Gita, we are studying chapter 6. This chapter is on meditation. We were on verse number 23. And uh, in the last few verses, Sri Krishna has given us certain valuable insights. Uh, these are profound, each of them are profound insights into Vedanta and into Vedantic meditation. what are these i will quickly recapitulate to set the stage for today's class so verse number 20 what are these insights which uh, krishna just uh, he just told us in verse number 20 um, sri krishna said yatra uparamate chittam niruddham yoga sevaya so one of the characteristics of vedantic meditation is chitta nirodha Uh, it is the cessation of mental activity or the, the the cessation of the modifications of the mind so this is classic patanjali yoga um, in patanjali yoga the practice is to is yoga chitta vritti nirodha the mind is constantly being transformed into various modifications ripples are coming up on the surface of the lake of the mind so to calm it down um to make it one pointed not to put it to sleep there's a difference between going to sleep and becoming one pointed so to make it one pointed uh, not to make it continuously transform into various vrittis or modifications one pointed in what to make it one pointed in the self in the atman i am satchidananda this should be the focus in a more broader sense uh, it could be also the devotional meditation that many of us practice where we have an ishta devata uh, the chosen deity and we visualize it and keep it one pointed in that so each successive modification of the mind is about the object of meditation not about different things which is the normal state of the mind so this is the first characteristic this is the characteristic of meditation and it's vedantic meditation when the object of meditation is the subject itself my real my own reality the atman and then it says yatra jayva atmana atmanam pashyam atmani tushyati the second characteristic is what is going on in uh, vedantic meditation is that i recognize that i am this witness consciousness all thoughts are lit up by that one consciousness that one awareness when i see hear smell taste touch all throughout i am aware that awareness is shining when i think i remember desire love hate um, imagine um, understand forget all confusion all of these mental internal mental modifications all throughout i am aware so the focus is on the awareness it's, it's let us say awareness of awareness so there is awareness choicelessly continuously shining to remember you're not becoming awareness or you're not switching on the awareness or consciousness it's always there. it's shining it is the nature of the self the atman itself but the mind is now drawing is attending to it the nature of awareness and this is tushyati it is happy there it is satisfied there it is settled there uh, it is um it is fulfilled there normally the mind moves into various modifications because it is attracted to this and that driving it all is the search for happiness or fulfillment now it finds fulfillment in the nature of of itself of of uh, atman why would it be fulfilling so i am awareness something like light illumining everything so why would it be fulfilling i mean why would i not want um cookies and um, you know uh, a nice sunset the company of friends uh, a nice book to read so why would i not seek fulfillment in all of that it's because i realize that this atman this awareness which i am is without limit it is the reality um, there is no lack there 
it is infinite in nature that's one second i also realize every other thing which attracts me outwards away from the self is an appearance in the self itself it's nothing other than the self in reality it is the self it is appearing as an other and as the other as the cookie as the nice sunset as the book they are all appearances they are not real in themselves all right they may not be real in themselves but can't they be satisfying only temporarily only in a superficial sense none of them because they are not real because they are not unlimited they are all limited and therefore whatever little uh, pleasure little satisfaction they can provide will be temporary it will come it will go it will not fulfill you it will not fulfill us it will not be permanent it will not be deep it will not be profound it will just leave a trace and will lead to further desires later on but none of it will be deeply deeply satisfying and the metaphysical reason philosophical reason for that is those things in which we are looking for satisfaction they are limited they cannot give us lasting satisfaction they are only appearances of the reality which we already are anyway that's a long winded way of saying what sri krishna said in deep meditation when you are aware of awareness your mind is settled in the atman in its nature as satchidananda chidananda rupa shivoham i am of the nature of consciousness i am of the nature of bliss or fulfillment i am shiva when settled there you you are also satisfied and fulfilled there then the next characteristic he points out is in verse 21 sukham atyantikam yat tad buddhi grahiham atindriyam the nature of happiness where it there it enjoys um the ultimate happiness sukham atyantikam and how do, how does it enjoy buddhi grahiham it is uh, it is that happiness is available through knowledge now what kind of happiness is available to us one is the worldly kind of happiness we are used to which is born of sense contact It's something that you see hear smell taste touch or imagine or expect even expectation leads to happiness an expectation of a pleasure so you you're expecting your friends visit you're expecting on these covid days you're expecting to take a vacation and a trip so that expectation itself generates pleasure so expectation the actual sense contact expectation of the sense contact imagination um memory all of these can generate pleasure so these are all the kinds of pleasures we are aware of from the grossest um, crudest pleasure of say uh, some nice food to refined pleasures you know art and and literature and all of that higher than this much more subtle much more refined than this is the joy of spirituality and uh, krishna is not even talking of that but it's the joy of spirituality where the joy of the self or the or you can say the joy of of divinity the divine presence it's born of meditation it's born of bhakti it's born of loving service to the divinity in various ways an extraordinary happiness a very pure kind of happiness comes which is unlike the first kind i talked about the external and internal pressures which we are familiar with in the world purer than this much more lasting much more satisfying much more nourishing than the worldly pleasures are the joys of um, of spirituality the joy of um, loving service to god the joy of uh, the devotional the feeling the presence of god of loving god the joy of prayer uh, the joy of renunciation shankaracharya sings kasya sukham na karoti viraga renunciation dispassion to whom does it not give joy you know enjoying something is give some pleasure letting go of that i do not want it that gives even greater happiness freedom and lightness so that is the second kind of joy which is the spiritual joy and the extreme forms of that would be the mystical experiences the feeling of the presence of god actual mystical visions of god so when sri ramakrishna would have visions of um, or the divine mother kali of krishna of the different forms of god every hair would stand on end with the thrill of it you can say you cannot 
imagine um, the incredible fulfillment happiness the 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 unimaginable joy of, of actually experiencing god that's the higher kind and the final kind is the atman itself which is joy itself it's not a kind of joy not even a mystical joy not even a spiritual joy but it is fulfillment itself it is infinity itself is fulfillment because it is infinity you are without limit there is no second reality apart from you this knowledge when it dawns it is the highest fulfillment it is the highest joy in itself so three kinds of joy one is vishayananda the joy of vishaya object in the world it's a worldly kind of joy bhajanananda the joy of spiritual practice it can culminate in visions mystical visions extraordinary joys and then brahmananda which is ananda which is the nature of the atman itself so here shri krishna is talking about second and third by meditation you get great joy there is no doubt about it so not just at the culmination he is talking here about samadhi but not just in samadhi even before that when meditation goes well it is initially a struggle but the moments it goes well it is it is very profound and it's very deep it's sometimes it's unforgettable it's very deep and very moving that is the joy of meditation and finally uh, what he's talking about atmananda or brahmananda the self which is ananda itself sukham atyantikam yattad buddhi grahyam atindriyam this is beyond the senses it's not a sensory joy so it's a spiritual joy bhajanananda not even that because he says buddhi grahyam it is born of knowledge what knowledge aham brahmasmi not born of a mystical experience so the joy of worldly experiences the joy of spiritual or mystical experiences and finally the joy of enlightenment brahman and the full enlightenment i am that reality all right that's the next insight is given another insight he says nachayam stitas chalati tatvata very interesting he says once attaining to this one can never lose it again one is firmly established in this what does it mean so even um the best of meditation in the initial stages is difficult to attain calmness of mind but one may attain a uh, deep samadhi and then one can stay in that for a long period of time but beyond that it still goes away samadhi also comes and goes it can be developed cultivated attained and then you can come out of it um in fact you better come out of it if you stay there long enough the body will die so if you want to continue living as an enlightened being you come out of it so that means even samadhi the state attained through samadhi is attained and lost it arises and then disappears again and can arise again also which means it is not um na you know chalati that it is not lost that's not true it is lost even the highest experiences even says sri ramakrishna's extraordinary visions of the divine mother and other deities but notice one thing they came and they went there was a before there was a during and there was an after but here krishna says once this is attained it's not lost what does it mean it means it's not really attained also it is ever attained we just we just get the realization of that that i am brahman i am of the nature of shiva when shankaracharya sings chidananda rupa ha shivoham i am of the nature of consciousness i am of the nature of bliss i am shiva it's not that i have become shiva now he realizes once innate ever existing shiva nature so all this sounds very mystical and mysterious also not mystical and mysterious you are aware of it right now it is the same awareness by which you are seeing and hearing you are looking at the computer screen you are hearing the sound same awareness you are aware you might say but that awareness does not seem very extraordinary it is it is the famous washerman stone uh, which sri ram krishna talked about the washerman who thought he had a stone strange stone with which he is to scrub clothes finally discovered it was a big diamond when he discovered what it was it was uh, enough to you know by selling it he could he had enough money to remove all his poverty you know the story i'm referring to i've mentioned it number of times so this awareness which you are experiencing right now 
it's the washerman stone you have it we don't know what it is vedanta just introduces us to our own glory so attaining which it is never lost means it can never be lost the clay pot can never be anything other than clay the golden ornament can can cannot be anything other than gold it can be a bracelet can be melted and crafted into a necklace a necklace can be melted and fashioned into a ring but all throughout necklace bracelet ring uh, in the melted condition whatever condition it is it is gold it is gold that's choiceless it can't be anything else having realized its gold status it's never lost what what it means it it always was gold now if the necklace did not know it was gold it always thought it was a necklace now it realizes my real nature is gold my necklace status is incidental it depends on a particular name a particular form a particular function it looks like this it's called a necklace and you put it on your neck these are just incidental but the reality throughout is this gold similarly the reality throughout is you the awareness you the existence then the next point he makes uh, krishna makes is yam labdhva chaparam labham manyate nadhikam tata there is nothing greater than this it may not seem so so god realization seems to be an amazing thing to be rich seems to be amazing to be learned seems to be amazing to be young and healthy seems to be amazing especially if you are old and sick um but to go to heaven seems to be amazing for people who believed in heaven at one time that was the goal but um this he says this is greater than all of that far greater having attained to which nothing greater remains every other kind of joy every other kind of of uh, happiness fulfillment is limited in time it has a beginning it has an end it is limited in space it is here and not not there and it is in one person it's not in the other person and it's limited in object it is something other than you that's why it came to you and it goes away from you whereas this one is not limited by time space and object once you recognize it you realize it was there forever and it will be there forever it will be there everywhere and it is nothing other than you every other joy depends on sattva rajas tamas this is the one thing that you are the joy that is your very self which does not depend on sattva rajas and tamas which does not depend on maya not only that every other joy every other fulfillment that we have in the world is actually a manifestation of this one it is the ocean shankaracharya says in his commentary in the taittiriya upanishad uh, brahmananda valli one place he says all the joys of the world which for which men are mad after are but spray from the ocean the endless ocean of bliss which lies within each of us just spray from that and we look at see it outside and chase it but the whole ocean is you so nothing greater than this is to be attained then the next insight he gives is this one helps us to overcome all suffering yes means teto na dukhe na guru na api vichalyate being this is verse number 22 22 yeah being established in which even the most uh, greatest of sorrows will not shake you notice this means the sorrows will keep coming so it's not that now i will not get old i become enlightened i will still get old i told you about that interview in the history channel i think history channel they wanted to know about immortality through yoga and so william shatner is the host and he went to space yesterday day for yesterday it was a very short space trip i think 11 minutes or something but anyway and he was so overcome by it if you see the statement he made he said it felt like i realized that this earth is life itself and the blackness of space is like death and we must learn to preserve this life but he is practically immortal himself he is 98 years old um ha huh. so old age will come disease will come there will be problems in the world covid will come difficult people will continue to be there all problems will come but 
on the power of this, this realization of, of our real nature, when this becomes a living reality, one can withstand, one can transcend sorrow. Then, so all this I discussed last time. And one more insight he gave. Tang vidya dukkha sanyoga viyogam yoga sangeetam. What a phrase. He uses the word yoga so in so many ways. He says, what is yoga? Yoga is dukkha sanyoga viyogam. It is the, the disconnection of the connection with, um, with sorrow. If you translate yoga as union. So what is union? Union is the disunion with the union with sorrow. Yoga Sangeetam, Dukkha Sanyoga Vyogam, that is a play on words. Um, it will not affect you. You can say like Sri Ramakrishna when he was asked, are you suffering from cancer? And his very interesting reply was, first he said, yes, it hurts. Then, somebody, then the questioner said, but sir, I see, I see that you are in, in bliss. And he said, oh, the rascal has found me out. Which means, is it true that there is pain? Yes. Is it true that, uh, you, he says, I cannot eat. Is it true? Was he play acting? No, all that is true. Is it true that at a deeper level, it's perfectly all right from him, for him? From that, there's a perspective in him, which from which perspective he says, it's fine. I'm actually in joy, whatever happens. Yes. The, the philosopher Arindam Chakravati told me about his guru, who was a great Vaishnava uh, teacher, Sitaram Das Omkarnath, in the early 20th century, um, mid 20th century. So he said he has himself seen in the last days of the saint, who, by the way, is not a non dualist, he is an out and out devotee of Krishna. So when they would treat him for bed sores and uh, tumor and all, and it, it would hurt. He would, he would squeal in laughter and pain at the same time. And you know, he, he would say, it hurts. And I would say, oh, the delight of it all. <laughs> the fun and the delight of it all. How, it's paradoxical. He sees the whole thing as a marvelous play. And it hurts. It still hurts. Disease hurts, bed sores hurt, and the tumor that's killing you is hurt. it hurts. All right. Then moving on. Number 24. Sankalpa Prabhavan Kaman Tyaktva Sarvana Sheshata Manaseva Indriya Gramam Vini Yamya Samantata having completely renounced all desires born of fancy, controlling well the senses from all sides by the mind alone, yoga should be practiced. So, some more advanced advice for meditators. Basic stuff is long over. You sit in this way, you breathe in this way, and so on. Uh, what kind of place you have to, you need for meditation, what is the seat should be like, how, what is the posture, all those things he has spoken about. The now advanced stuff. So one thing about calming the mind. Um, Indriya gramam viniyamya samantata. Grama means collection. Collection of the senses. Sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch. So all of these, the five senses, should be withdrawn from their objects. Don't try to see anything. Don't try to hear anything. And do not smell or taste or touch anything. Um, now, you can close your eyes, but how do you, you can even plug your ears, but how do you prevent your skin from feeling the cold or the heat? How do you prevent your nose or your know, taste, sense of taste? So all of those things are active all the time. So what is meant here, the real meaning of withdrawing the senses is mentally. So mentally withdraw the senses, but you turn the mind inwards. What does that mean? We have all noticed it. That suppose you're focused on a book. So people come and go, there are sounds in the background. You notice, you, after some time you realize you haven't noticed it. Um, I've seen kids back in India and school kids 
so focused on the cricket match on the TV. It's hot and sweaty and there are mosquitoes. And nothing to them. Now you tell them, all right, enough of this. Let's sit down and study. And immediately, how can we study? It's too hot to study. And these mosquitoes and it's so sweaty. And I'm hungry. None of that mattered when you're watching the cricket match. Now, what, what's going on there? It's because the mind is so focused on it. There's so much interest that automatically the mind gets focused. All the other sensory inputs don't matter. They don't break your concentration. Similarly, with the mind focused on the object of meditation, whatever your practice is, it could be the breath, it could be the mantra, it could be a deity visualization, or specifically in this case, the nature of the self. Focused on that, turned inwards from the senses. So you lose interest in the objects of the senses. How do you do that? Sankalpa prabhavan kamaan stiktva sarvan asheshata. So this is uncompromising. He says, by giving up all desires. And he says, how do you do that? He says, these desires are born of our, um, there's no word, for, specific word for that, sankalpa. Sankalpa, it, he has translated as fancies. It's just the conceptions of niceness. In, there's a technical word for it in Advaita called shobhana adhyasa. That which is absolutely of no use to you, ultimately of no good to you, yet we think it's nice. Uh, I like it. It's necessary for me. Or the opposite. It's awful. I can't bear it. It's terrible. In both these cases, the mind will run, rush out to that and the senses will now be utilized to direct its attention to those things. And mind will become externalized. Meditation is not possible. So sankalpa is that root. That root now blossoms out into kaman. Kaman means desires. At this stage, it is now, I got to have it. I have to see this. I have to taste that food. I have to meet this celebrity. Or something like that. All of these things, they are now in the form of desire. Very difficult to control. At that level, it's very difficult to control. So he says, at the level, at the level of the root itself, you squash it. It's easier at that level. Sankalpa Pravan Kaman, Sarvan, all of them don't keep remnants. So spiritual practitioners, we make the mistake of keeping remnants. All the obviously gross stuff, it's, it's, um, it's rooted out. But a little bit of harmless thing. The thing is, a little bit of harmless uh, indulgence. Now the mind will grab onto that itself as its lifeline. Anything to save itself from meditation. So <laughs> I remember once I was very sick and uh, the hospital, our, our mon monastery hospital there. So they had Reader's Digest. They had this person who would go around to the patients every week with books and things that I would read. I would have, uh, I borrowed Reader's Digest, old Reader's Digest to read. I thought it was sort of innocent and harmless. Uh, we had this strict old monk who was also sick in a nearby bed. And once he was telling me uh, that, um, um, you know, these days, it's, it's, um, it's scandalous. I've seen monks wasting their time. I asked them, what, what are you doing? What are you reading? Is it something uh, enlightening? Is it something nourishing? No, they are reading Reader's Digest. Would you think, <laughs> would you believe it? And I had Reader's Digest under my pillow. So I, I desperately leaned back on the pillow, hoping that he wouldn't notice. Uh, and I was like, you don't say, really? Reader's Digest? But there's a point there. Sarvan Asheshata, without any remainder whatsoever. And Asheshata, without any remainder, but also it means at the subtle levels also. Not just the gross ones, the desires, but the subtle levels also you give up. You see, it's difficult. No, it's not difficult. Um, your satisfaction comes from the object of meditation. From That's why bhakti is so powerful. Bhakti is basically connected to desire. So I love my Krishna, my Ramakrishna or my Durga. This is Durga Puja. It's the uh, uh, final day. Vijaya Dashami. Today is the conclusion of Durga Puja. So I love my Divine Mother so much. I don't want anything else. When you, when you have that kind of love, you, you it, it would be intolerable to think of spend time with 
something that is not the object of your love. So Vijaya Dashami, on this day, the image of Durga is immersed. Um, so we have, I think it was Mathur Babu. Who was it? Or Girish Babu. Um, in Sri Ramakrishna's uh, gospel, it's there. At the end of the Durga Puja, he is so overcome. He doesn't want to let the image go. The, the whole puja is that you worship the Divine Mother. The image is just the uh, just the locus, the basis of your worship. And so, to complete the cycle, you immerse it back in the in the Ganga. It goes. It had come from the unmanifest to the manifest. It goes back to the unmanifest. But the heart doesn't want that. Here is my mother. She is here. I'm not going to throw her into the <laughs> river. And so, he, so he's weeping uncontrollably. What is that? And that, that is love. And it's love for God. So at that point, none of the worldly pleasures, the company of friends or other indulgences would make any sense. It, they would be seen as irritants or, or disturbances. So Asheshata, even the subtle ones are given up. All right. So this is the meaning. Sankalpa Prabhavan Kaman Tyaktva Sarvan Asheshata. Down to the subtlest desires, desires give them up. Um, at the root, before they blossom into full-fledged desires. The root is, what is the root? About things in the world, people in the world, places in the world, certain times in our life, um, possessions, um, my personal theories, political convictions, uh, the sports team I, I support, all of these are, are uh, you know, the complexes in our mind. And a lot of emotional baggage is attached to each of them. Um, things I love or hate. So let that go. And you replace it. That uh, The mind should flow to the divine. Emotions should flow to the divine. In this way, what will happen? The result will be my effort at withdrawing from external engagement. This is meditation. Advanced instruction meditation. My effort at withdrawing from external uh, engagement and settling down on the object of meditation, the breath, the deity, the mantra, or ultimately the nature of you know, awareness of awareness, it will be successful. Because the mind is not pushing outwards. If the mind is not pushing outwards, it will not activate the, the sensory centers. You know, The senses are like instruments. In fact, in Vedanta, they are called instruments. Karana. Karana means instrument. The mind wants to go outside and picks up certain instruments, like apps. So here's, a, here's an instrument, here's an app, a visual app to see, is an audio, uh, audio app to hear, or a taste, or a smell, um, or a touch. And the mind picks up these and goes out into the world to do its thing. Now it doesn't want to do that. So these apps remain um, you know, dormant. So they are not active. They are not pulling your attention outwards. Then. How do you do this? 25. Further instruction. Shane Shaneir Uparamed Buddhya Dhritigrihitaya Atma Sangstham Mana Kritva Nakin Cheda Pichintayet. Withdrawing thus by degrees, um, establishing the mind in the self by the intellect, regulated by concentration. One and sh one should not think of anything else. So this is the culmination of yoga, Patanjali yoga, culminating in samadhi, savikalpa samadhi, and finally nirvikalpa samadhi. Or Patanjali terms, sampragyata samadhi, culminating in a sampragyata samadhi. Remember here, the entire technology of uh, Patanjali yoga is being borrowed and used by Vedanta. Vedanta may not use, or may not agree with the philosophical conclusions of Patanjali yoga. But here the technology of Patanjali Yoga, the Ashtanga Yoga, is fully accepted by Vedanta. This is a powerful technology of concentration and focus. So um, it is now fixed on the Atman. How is it done? First of all, Shanai Shanai Ruparamed, slowly, by degrees. This has two meanings. First of all, the direct meaning, it takes time. Patanjali is also clear. It takes time. Uh, systematic. Um, and consistent practice over a long period of time, it leads to establishment in yoga. This is one of the sutras of Patanjali. Um, 
one should not be like Hanuman who jumped over the sea to go to Lanka, you know, from going from India to Sri Lanka. Now, we are not, most of us are not cut out that way. You know, even Rama had to build a bridge to walk from uh, India to Sri Lanka. So, uh, we have to build that bridge and walk slowly, systematically. One should not be, in Hindi they say, Hatakarita. Um, stubborn, foolishly stubborn, let's say. Hatmi, uh, hata means foolishly stubborn. By force. One should not do that. There is a system to approach it because these are very delicate things. It's it's um, subtler than the body, subtler than the prana. Uh, it's, it's mind, it's emotion, it's intellect and beyond that. Therefore, you're dealing with very subtle uh, levels of your personality. You can't force it. You can't force enlightenment. You can force God and then God can give you the enlightenment, but... Uh, you yourself cannot force samadhi, for example. If, if you force it, it that itself uh, foils the attempt at samadhi. Effort can take you to meditation. It can take you to savikalpa samadhi also. But beyond that, nirvikalpa samadhi is not effort. It's not an effort of the will. If you do that, and then the, you'll slip away from samadhi because that's also a movement of the mind. Um, So here, I don't know if we have time, I can tell you the story. I've told this earlier also, but it's such a moving story, let me tell you. The story about the grace of the Guru, the importance of um, systematic spiritual practice, but yet also the beauty of you know, sincerity, the, the restlessness of the heart for God. So the, all these things are there in the story. So this story I heard from uh, Swami Ramananda Saraswati. He was a traditional monk in the north of India. He passed away several years ago. I mean, not several years ago, I think less than a decade ago. But he was regarded as a highly evolved spiritual soul. He was a non-dualist, but very syncretic in the sense that uh, he accepted devotion fully. He was a meditator, a Patanjali yogi, and also he was... He was very fond of Kashmiri Shaivism. He even taught, studied and taught those texts. So very um, typically Hindu, uh, open to all streams of thought and all. But fundamentally, he was his, his uh, home tradition was Advaita Vedanta. I met him a few times. So once he told this story about the grace of the Guru. But the story has so many other aspects. Um, so the story goes like this. Uh, he had been told, he wanted to become a monk. His guru told him many, many decades ago when he was a young student to go back to Banaras and finish his studies. So he went back to Banaras and he was a brahmacharya studying at a traditional Sanskrit school. So I'm talking about Ramananda Saraswati. This brahmachari uh, studying at a traditional Sanskrit school. And um, one day he came across a little book. This book was about a Krishna Bhakta, a boy who was the devotee of Krishna. So just his life story. So the Swami said, I read the book and the story goes like this. There was a little boy in uh, Vrindavan, the place of Krishna. And this boy grew up like everybody does in Vrindavan with stories of Krishna. And he was so devoted to Krishna, he thought, I want to see Krishna. Because everybody says, you can see Krishna in Vrindavan. So he, a little boy, he believed it. And so he went to a, to a tree just outside their village and he sat down there. I've heard that there is a marker near the tree now. Anyway, he sat down there and he started calling on Krishna. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't go back oh, home. He wouldn't eat. At first, it, people found it a curiosity and uh, they thought it was a nice little boy and to be so devoted to Krishna. But as the day went on and the next day he wouldn't come home, his parents got worried, the villagers got worried, they tried to persuade him in all ways to come back home to eat something. He said, no, I have to see Krishna. I will not eat until I see Krishna. So after two or three days, and already as it happens in India, immediately crowds start collecting. You know, anybody, anything to do with God, it will immediately attract people, especially in a place like Vrindavan. So people started visiting this little boy who was calling on Krishna and 
he was getting weaker day by day and so finally the villagers went to this uh, monk who lived nearby uh, in vrindavan uh, yes in vrindavan so his name uh, it is to call him odia baba the monk from orissa he was a very highly regarded monk in those days a non dualist so they went and uh, they told him about this little boy it was already i think a week since the boy had eaten and so they told him and they said we are all very worried he won't listen to any of us and so this monk said i'll go and talk to him and he went and he found the little boy already very weak under the little tree under the tree and calling on krishna and he said i'm very pleased with you my boy this is wonderful that you have so much devotion but this is not the way uh, there is a way to do this there is a whole body of knowledge a system in which one can practice and finally uh, you know realize god you are a fit aspirant you are a you are a real seeker of god i can see that and i will teach you i will make you my disciple and i will teach you which was a very great honor because um, that swami was i mean there's so many people who wanted to become his disciples and here is himself offering that little boy of all people that i'll accept you as a disciple but my condition is you must eat now you must at least drink something and eat something now uh, in hindi he said i say hat se nahi hota hai hata means so by force by stubbornness is kya ek tarika hai there is a way to do this the boy said that all right i will uh, uh, i'll uh, uh, listen to you but tomorrow come tomorrow i'll break my fast and i will drink fruit juice from your hands so everybody was relieved and they went back home that night suddenly this monk this old monk he woke up in his ashram you know uneasily there was something uh, he felt uneasy at the first do- break of light in dawn he ran he literally ran back to that tree outside that little village and he found that the little boy was dead uh, he he had passed and uh, that night he had a vision the why he was uneasy he told people later this monk told other people that last night i had a I had a dream or a vision that a divine being the divine you know like they say ratha like divine chariot it came down from the abode of krishna from from vaikuntha and uh, it landed in front of the boy and it, the child got on the on this celestial chariot or something and it disappeared back into the realms it had come from so that was the story now this monk who told us the story uh, swami ramananda saraswati he said i was so moved by this um little boy story that uh, i decided what am i doing all this study sanskrit grammar and all that all that is i don't want to do all this i i want to uh, realize god and so i'm going to go away to vrindavan and search for krishna or i'll die in the attempt and he thought but but i should tell my guru because uh, the old man told me to study so he goes back to his guru's ashram and tells the guru i'm sorry i can't keep my word i'm not going to complete my studies and i understand if you're not going to accept me as your disciple but i want to this is the thing i read this story and i want to see krishna and i'm going to go to rindavan and spend the rest of my life as long as i live looking for krishna i'm searching for god the guru said same thing you know that this is not the way there is a there's a way to do it and uh, don't be emotional and then he said i was young i was emotional and i said no if that boy could do it i'll do it too i'd i'd rather die than you know just follow this old method of you know study and, and uh, becoming a monk and all of these this old systems i just go straight to god and i'm willing to die and he, he said i walked away i ignored what my guru told me and i walked away i was so young and charged with emotion and enthusiastic and he says they were nearly they were you know like it was his eyes were moist he said that look at the grace of that old man my guru he started walking behind me and i scolded him what are you doing i just came here to tell you that i won't be i won't follow your instructions i'm going to go away to vrindavan you don't have to come with me you have a whole ashram um you go back and stay there i don't want you to come with me the guru said you can't stop me 
I can't stop you from going to Vrindavan, but you can't stop me from following you. I will go with you. And so they went together to Vrindavan and they stayed there. And he says, Ramanda Saraswati told us that we stayed there for, uh, I would go with a little cottage we stayed there. In the morning, I would leave and I would wander around the temple. There are beautiful temples of Krishna. They are very ancient ones with amazing atmosphere. So he said, I would go from temple to temple. I became like a madman. I would go there, pray, meditate, weep. And I would, you know, I don't know where. I was like I was possessed by a storm. In the evening, I would, uh, at the dark descended, temples would be closed. I would come back to that little hut, uh, exhausted. And my guru, the old man, he would be waiting there with a piece of bread he had begged from you know, people around. And then he would share it with me and we would eat. And my guru took out this book, uh, Tripura Rahasya, which is a Vedantic Tantric text and very non-dualistic, not very devotional at all. And he said, read this. And I would get irritated. And she said, I don't want to read this. I don't feel like reading such things. I said, no, read it. Just read it to me. And so I would read it one chapter a day. And the next day would go like that. I would wander from place to place like of this mad person. Um, of course, I didn't, didn't get to see Krishna anywhere. Uh, and then come back and the same thing would be repeated. That book has 30 chapters. 30 days passed. 30 chapters were over. My madness was calmed, came to my senses. And my guru said, let's go back. And we, we went back and he said, go back to your studies. Finish your studies and come back. And he said, I did that. And I came back and I became a monk later on. And that's a long story. So and um, that was he said, I think, like 60 years ago. So it's a beautiful story, really. And it's a story of that little boy and this intense love of God. And he found his reward. In spite of being non-methodical, non-traditional, without any system, without any Vedanta, Vedanta classes, just by sheer love of God, uh, he, found his, uh, he found God. But also, the importance of Guru, and the importance of uh, Vedanta, all these vast systems of knowledge which have, we have developed over millennia, not just centuries, millennia. People have walked on this path. It is a path. So have patience and walk on this path. Krishna says, shane shane, slowly, slowly, systematically, slowly, step by step. Don't jump. Um, also, another interpretation would of this would be, what else was I going to tell you? So, yeah, systematically, slowly, but consistently, not um, lazily. I'm Krishna told me to take it slow, so I'm taking it slow. I meditate once a week and go to a class uh, twice a week. That's it. The rest of the time, nothing. I'm taking it slow. Won't work that way. Sri Ramakrishna said uh, he did not like this kind of lack of enthusiasm. So enthusiasm, that's, that's the difficult part of it. And yet systematic. So Krishna later will say that's the sign of a sattvic mind. Dhriti utsaha samanvita. And endowed with enthusiasm and patience. You have people who are very enthusiastic. But they are enthusiastic about different things each day. Something today, something <laughs> tomorrow. There are people who are patient and uh, methodical and they actually make more progress. But they lack that fire sometimes. They sometimes become mechanical. So a sattvic mind is fresh. I have seen such people, old monks, but such fresh minds, uh, childlike, fresh minds. They're looking at everything with the eyes of, of a child. So that is freshness is there, enthusiasm is there, and yet systematic, disciplined. Shane, shane, slowly, slowly, systematically. Now the other meaning would be that uh, Move from the uh, from the obvious to the not so obvious, from the physical to the subtle. So notice um, how the pancha kosha viveka, for example, proceeds. Methodology used in Vedanta. I am pure consciousness, witness consciousness. Wait a minute, not so fast. Start with what is most obvious, what you are most confident of. It's like mounting the staircase. You don't hop, skip, and jump. You'll fall if you do that. You put your foot on the first step, 
and maintain your balance there. I mean, you be steady there before you go to the next step and so on. Like climbing a mountain, for example. You're sure of your foothold and then you proceed further. So start with the most obvious, the physical, the body. Now, instead of trying to be aware of awareness, be aware of the body. We are often not aware of the body. Most of the time we are in our heads, thinking thoughts. So aware of the body the sensations of the body and so on and so forth. We have full awareness of the body. This be firmly in this step. This is called the food sheet, Annamaya. Then systematically, slowly turn your attention to the prana, breath. And why would you do that? There are these understandings that the body is changing, I'm not changing, and the body is an object, I'm the experiencer of that object, and the body is insentient, I'm sentient, and so many uh, arguments are there. I'm not going to that, but the point here is, from the physical body, you go to something subtler. Not totally subtle. It is just the breath. The breath is also physical, but more subtle than the body. The in-breath and the out-breath. That is the tip of the iceberg. The whole iceberg is prana, the physiological processes keeping this body alive. Stay there for some time. Be fully aware of that. Then go to something more subtle, which is the mind. Thoughts, ideas, memories, emotions desires. Be aware of what's going on in the mind. A pretty subtle level already. Then go even more subtle. The understanding itself. The whole conceptual structure we have. The knowledge of I am this. That is the intellect. Then go further behind that. Beyond that, if you push further, you will reach a very subtle blankness. And notice then, from there you go to the awareness which was illumining all of these. So instead of jumping to I am the awareness in be, uh, and I am the witness of everything, body, shane shane, slowly, slowly, breath. So at each step we have a firm foothold. You are confident of each step. Not mixed up. You have not slipped away into thinking at some point. You are just looking at every step is real to you. Body is obviously real. The breath is real. Thinking is real. And you go some, the mind, attention becomes more subtle and more refined. The intellect, that should be clear and real. What, what are you talking about? Beyond that, pushing beyond that, full awareness and yet blankness. Ob object, there's no object to be aware of. And from there to awareness of awareness. Shanai, shanai. Uparamit, withdraw. Seize. Literally, uparamana means seizing, cessation. Seize. And then, and hold on, buddhya, by understanding. Why not the body? I'm attending to the body, you're saying, now withdraw to the, uh, to the breath. Why? Understanding. Why I cannot be the body? Why I'm something other than the body? And understanding and the quest, I'm looking for myself, the reality. Self with capital S. Why not the breath? Why not mind? We generally, without question, all of us, we tend to think of ourselves as thinking beings. So why not the mind? See, the same arguments apply and so on. So buddhya, by understanding. By Vedant, understanding means the understanding saturated by Vedantic um, teaching, which is where all Gita, Upanishad, Rig Drishya, Vivek, Aparoksha, Anubhuti, all these classes come in. It, it saturates our understanding with this way of thinking. This helps you in meditation, Vedantic meditation. Driti Grihitaya. Um, driti here means focus or concentration. So not only understanding, maintain the focus. Don't slip away into irrelevancies. Don't flow outward into the world again. Having done this, finally you will be aware of awareness, really, not as a concept. Not unstably also. Atma Sanstham. Establish yourself in awareness or the awareness self. Then don't think anything else. That means don't slip back into thinking again. Stay there in that luminosity. So these are pretty advanced instructions actually. I was just looking at this book, uh, Alan Wallace, uh, who writes about Buddhist meditation. He's a philosopher at the University of Santa Barbara, I think, uh, UCSB. So he's written a book called Meditations of a Buddhist Skeptic. 
So there he has a very interesting two chapters. I really haven't gone through it yet. I'm looking forward to it. So these techniques from an Indian perspective and a Tibetan perspective, the original Buddhist techniques were in India and what, what were the techniques and then how they were further refined in Tibet. So then I think we are out of time almost. All right, we'll just leave it here. Let me look at the comments. There are many comments here. Awareness of awareness also comes and goes. Yeah, the, so the attention to awareness comes and goes. Fine. But notice, so Shweta is saying this. So the, the awareness that I'm Shweta, you may think about it, you may not think about it. But at no point do you think that I am not Shweta. If I'm not thinking that I'm Shweta, uh, do I stop being Shweta? No. Whether I think about it or I do not think about it, I am Sarva Priyananda. It is, seems to be obvious to me. This is knowledge, jnana. When I attend to being Sarva Priyananda, that is awareness of being Sarva, Sarva Priyananda. So the knowledge will tell you that I am awareness whether I attend to it or not. Now here, this is because the chapter, the chapter is on meditation. So you are attending to it. You're trying to be aware of, of that I am awareness. So this is the whole attempt. Um, unless we do this, it will not uh, result in full-blown enlightenment. But this is also an attempt. That's why it can be done. And it can be undone. It can be not done. I'm translating Shankaracharya's comment. Um, kattum akattum anyathava kattum shakyate. It can be done. It may not be done. It may be done in a different way. That's the nature of meditation, Shankaracharya says. Gaurav Mittal says, Na chayang sthitas chalati tattvata. Does it mean that when this mind in waking state recognizes that I am Brahman, that this recognition will carry over to the states like dream state, deep sleep, and after death? Yes. I understand that I am awareness is always true. But this recognition is in the mind. So theoretically, mind can lose it. Having realized it as gaining or losing, both are unreal. True. But once ignorance is removed, it will never come back again. Notice, one thing that, that it persists, even in dream state, is uh, that you are aware. You are aware of things happening in the dream state. When it permeates every moment of your existence in the waking state, no matter what you are happening in the waking state, Similarly, whatever your dream may be, it will permeate your dream state. And in the deep sleep, it's only that in the deep sleep, you will not be thinking that I am awareness of deep sleep. There's, in that case, you are not in deep sleep. But the awareness is, of course, always there. More precisely, it's no longer important after that. This is what you know, Vedanta Sara, we did in Vedanta Sara, that breakthrough, that enlightenment, which is called in Vedanta Sara, Brahmakara Vritti or Advaita Vedanta, it's called Brahmakara Vritti. The question was raised, if you remember in Vedanta Sara, after that Vritti, after that moment of enlightenment, does that enlightenment flash, does it persist or not? And the answer was, no, it doesn't. It, it also becomes part of the world of appearance. And you are that, that Brahman in which waking, dreaming, deep sleep come and go. So you're no longer dependent upon the waking mind to tell you, you are awareness, you are Brahman. You're no longer dependent upon this mind here in the waking state. I am Brahman. No. The mind is dependent upon you. It, it is. So whenever the mind functions, it will be surcharged with the awareness and the awareness of awareness. You know that you are that awareness. Vrinda says, being aware of awareness is the difference between Samadhi and Sushupti. Yes. Rodrigo says, how do you withdraw the mind from the gravitational pull? Um, Rodrigo, would you clarify what gravitational pull? So when he unmutes, we'll see. Patrick says, sankalpa, seen translated as a resolve or firm decision. This is a different meaning, yes. So firm decision or sankalpa is when you make up your mind to do something. In the ritualistic sense, when you start a puja, you take a sankalpa. 
that I am going to do this worship for this purpose. It could be a worldly purpose or it could just be for the blessings of God for my spiritual life. That's called a sankalpa, which is in the sense of a resolve or firm decision. Here, the word sankalpa is, uh, refers to the root stage, which finally um, sort of develops into a desire. All our judgments about the world, uh, they start off as these sankalpas. Jayashree says, how does this sankalpa differ from the sankalpa taken during the puja? Yes, that's exactly what I talked about. The sankalpa during a puja is a result. I do this puja, uh, worship of, say, Ganesha or Durga for the welfare of humanity. This is a sankalpa and I start the activity. But this sankalpa is, uh, is a subtle form of which ultimately becomes a desire. Parul says, the state of calm or bliss I experience in meditation on a particular day sometimes becomes the benchmark on another. How do I press my reset button? Don't bother about all of that. Uh, I mean, let it be. The memory of that calmness, it will be there in your mind. It's not a bad thing. Rick says the self realizes the self, but it does so in the context of a human life for which a gross and subtle body are necessary. Correct. Yes, correct. We retire and reach the threshold, threshold of enlightenment through the intellect, a function of the subtle body. Again, correct. If the gross body is damaged or killed, it, is it the intellect by which self-realization is? If the gross body is damaged or killed, is it the intellect by which self-realization is not lost? Um, as I said, in the path of knowledge, is ignorance, the whole framework is that ignorance is stopping us from realizing what we are. So ignorance is overcome by knowledge. And the instrument of knowledge which we have ultimately is the intellect. So it is used um, for gaining that enlightenment. But once you realize what you are, you also realize in what sense you are not dependent on the physical body or the subtle body. And then it does not, does not matter anymore. Um, I mean, if the screen which had forgotten itself as identifying itself as a character in the movie suddenly realizes I'm a screen, using the character to a certain extent, suddenly it, it makes that shift. After that, whatever happens to that character doesn't matter. It's, uh, I realize I'm not only that character, I'm all characters and ultimately none of them. There are accounts of enlightened beings still functioning on some higher plane after death. Is that by virtue of the finest level of intellect that purified subtle body as a whole or what? Yes, they continue to be sentient beings. If they continue to be personal beings for whatever reason, Sri Ramakrishna would say that depends on the will of God. After enlightenment also, some retain their personality. Um, and what do you mean by retaining personality? Even when the physical body goes, the subtle body persists. Rodrigo says on Ramananda Saraswati, the guru of Professor Stanishwar Timalsina. No, this is a different Ramananda Saraswati. Shweta says, what was the name of the book you mentioned? Oh, yeah. Rodrigo has mentioned it. Meditations of a Buddhist Skeptic. Manifesto for Mind Sciences and Contemplative Practice. It's one of his recent books. But he has many, many good books on uh, Buddhist meditation. Rodrigo says, I mean, awareness of gravitation. Mm. I'm still not sure. Awareness of gravitation. Gravitation is a physical thing, right? I should think about that. Srinivas Raju says, can we say aware of awareness is generally at Chidavasa level before realization of the absolute or pure con uh, consciousness. Can we say awareness of awareness is generally at Chidabhasa level? Awareness of awareness as a practice which Krishna is mentioning is definitely being done by the mind and which means Chidabhasa is there, the reflected consciousness. But the whole point is it will point you out to something beyond the mind and the reflected consciousness. Um, so it, so this is a practice. This is a part of the meditation, which is part of the sixth chapter, which is being taught. Krishna is teaching you some advanced level of meditation here. But that's not the goal. 
the goal is the atman itself which is there which has to be revealed uh, once it's revealed all of this becomes immaterial rick says a question from alpana one gets such waves when where one doesn't want to continue with sadhana what should one do give in to stopping the practices so are there for some time come back or force oneself to continue a practice without bhava it depends there's certain amount of discipline which has to be mentioned uh, maintained but if the reaction is so much they don't like it and it becomes mechanical or one is feeling upset the beauty of spiritual life is there's such a variety of practices available to us stop meditating for some time read something uh, you know inspiring it could be it could be philosophical it could be devotional it could be the lives of um, saints lives are particularly inspiring and soothing um, listen to devotional music or get up and do something like a service activity or something or some secular activity also but mentally offer it to god so such a variety of practices are possible or just take a walk <laughs> Oh, and at all times, please realize that these reactions, sometimes they're so powerful, they're uncontrollable. But they're reactions of the mind. You are perfectly all right. Keep that in mind. And that also you have to keep it in mind. But you, the self, the witness of these reactions, you are perfectly all right. Even when the mind is throwing up a storm, the vast sky is still the vast sky, even if a thunderstorm is going on. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu